So I'm going to deal with oral narratives, biographical accounts that were recorded in 1997 in the village of Iskur. It's here, the red spot. <laughs> it's in the northeast of Bulgaria, southeast of here. And um, uh, I'm going to deal with them uh, uh, and I'm going to uh, reread them because they are already published in a book. Uh, and uh, uh, in the course of this analysis, uh, I will uh, try to, to, to see how the myth of the modern person, uh, somebody who is an actor, an agent, and uh, who is responsible for his own life and for the, his biographical trajectory, is intermingled with another myth, the myth of chance. And uh, by the end of this analysis, I, I hope I will come with, up with some conclusions they were a bit unexpected to me, so I will look forward to your comments at the end of this. Um, so, um, it's been a while since uh, historians have started uh, discussing the role of myths in historiography, and as it was beautifully presented in Diana Mishful's presentation, uh, they are already aware of the fact that um, historiography is uh, mixed with myths and uh, the function uh, of myths is to form identities and collective identities and to forge bonds and to direct people's actions into one common goal. Uh, but little attention has been paid to the way uh, myths function in oral narratives and biographical accounts uh, because I think that by default, they so um, unquestioningly fall into the area of uh, uh, fiction. Uh, they are so supposed to be prone to exaggeration and to uh, falsification that they are very, very rarely given, um, how to say, a proper uh, account and a, pro a proper consideration. So this is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to uh, see how myths function in oral uh, biographical accounts because if you want to see how people act on a daily basis in everyday life and if you want to see how their choices are directed and uh, how their agencies are constructed, I think that it's exactly myths that we need to look at. And uh, the, the problem is, and uh, it was mentioned before, there are a lot of objections to using uh, oral narratives and biographical accounts because they have a, how to say, a very, uh, very problematic truth value. So how can we deal with them? How can we analyze them uh, as real sources of information? Okay, information is not the true word, uh, the right word, but as real sources of something they can tell us. Uh, sources of meaning. Uh, so uh, what I'm drawing on is uh, uh, Austin's uh, observations on performative utterances. Uh, so he what he says is that um, uh, mm, the better part of human uh, utterances and actually narratives, uh, they are far from being uh, uh, descriptions of the, of the reality. They are not true or false. Rather than this, uh, they need to, uh, or they aim at uh, presenting reality and <coughs> performing the reality. Uh, so they shouldn't be judged as true or false, but as uh, uh, felicitous or infelicitous, corresponding or not corresponding to the context. So this is, this is where I start from. When we deal with uh, oral narratives, with biographical accounts, we shouldn't be looking into uh, their descriptive value, but we should be looking at the way they perform the past reality now. And uh, uh, the famous, uh, a, a very often quoted uh, example of how we do things with words, how we uh, perform reality, is uh, this when you name a ship, for example, uh, uh, with uh, saying, I name this ship Azura, you actually create a kind of reality. So, uh, this is uh, uh, the main thing. Uh, the speaking, the, the oral narratives, they have a kind of performative value. They are uh, dramaturgical in their essence. They do things. They present the reality in a way. 
and even things that we consider as uh, for granted, for example, the, uh, the and can very much connected with uh, biology, like uh, for example, gender. Uh, Judith Butler goes on to say that actually this is not a kind of essence. It is something that has been constructed and uh, through numerous reiterations and repetitions it has been considered as something taken for granted, but actually it consists of a lot of discontinuous pieces. They seem to be seamless, but they are not. And something very important, and this is really important to me because this, uh, how to say, uh, puts the question of change if we repeat the same reality again and again, how is historical change and actually how are the transforma transformations of myths possible. So she says that, I'm, go I'm going to quote this, just the short extract. Uh, so she says that if the ground of gender identity is stylized repetition of acts through time and not a seemingly seamless identity, then the possibility of gender transformation are to be found in the arbitrary rela relations between such acts, in the possibility of a different sort of repetition in breaking or subversive repetition of that style. So, and this is, this is <laughs> where I start from, uh, when we are dealing with uh, biographical accounts, we shouldn't be looking to the clear cuts extracts and to the clear and to the unambiguous and problematic uh, pieces we should be looking at uh, the problematic areas the the places where the narrative seems to shift to switch and uh, this is a sign that uh, how to say the for the the past reality is performed in a slightly new way there is a problem so the myth that the person repeats is actually a bit shaken. Probably it's not clearly articulated, but, um, uh, but is put into question. So, and this is even uh, more true when we're talking about uh, post-socialist narratives. Because uh, how do you narrate your life in a situation when the, how to say, the all-encompassing power of the socialist state has scrambled? And uh, it tries to find its problematic integration in the in the present, uh, problematic to say the least. Uh, so, how do you narrate uh, your life as a part of this past? And at the same time, how do you save face? I mean, how do you present yourself in an acceptable, socially acceptable way? So, um, this were, this is uh, where I think uh, the respondents from these uh, uh, interviews they. Uh, refer to the myth of chance as a kind of uh, a kind of narrative strategy with which they can present their life as a whole entity. They can present themselves as rational agents, as people who were responsible for the direction of their life. But on the same, uh, at, at the same time, they could, how to say, save face, and they could retreat from uh, I, uh, agency uh, when there was a problem in their in the development of their uh, of their life when there there was something that they cannot articulate now so uh, in this way the the myth of chance that's how I call it or the inexplicable something that cannot be explained uh, it's a kind of glue that sticks together the the narrative but it is also a, a, a sign of problem. It is a symptom that the past comes to the present, uh, but in a problematic way. And it cannot be articulated because there aren't still some routinized and stylized strategies how to uh, interpret it, how to present it now, how to present the past now. Okay, so uh, the, the question is whether this reference to the myth of chance is uh, a kind of uh, pre-modern remnant, uh, because you know uh, that uh, pre-modern people they tended to uh, how to say to to refer to the inexplicable, to the interference of some forces beyond their hold and beyond their control in in people's lives. Uh, so the question is: Is this a pre-modern remnant when uh, respondents talk about this or it is a kind, and it seems to me actually, that uh, it is a kind of, uh, probably it comes from the past but it is made functional in everyday socialist uh, culture 
because the, the, the official uh, socialist culture, of course, doesn't allow any chances when agents face uh, some kind of problematic reality, they have to deal with it, they, ha they have to rationalize it, to face it, and actually there was an example of a person who closely sticks to this kind of, uh, to this kind of, uh, uh, how to say, uh, model uh, socialist behavior. He says, um, I was never afraid in those days. When I was a young state official, I was never afraid of the upcoming events. Nobody could influence me. I was very independent. I was upfront. I was very direct. Perhaps to tell you the truth, this is the reason why I used to suffer so much. But I've never regretted my relentlessness and my beliefs. I've never had two or three faces. I've never regretted it, I told you, my convi convictions. convictions sorry. Uh, the only problem is that they caused a lot of damage to my nervous system. Uh, but even this guy, uh, who how to say, is a representative of the hardline um, self-identification, he also uh, tells on later in his uh, uh, interview, he says that uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, he became a political officer or member of the uh, state security. So. He also refers to some inexplicable things when he talks about his uh, biography. Uh, so uh, I decided to focus on the uh, way uh, people talk about their professional development and how they uh, rely on this chance when they talk about their professional development because it seems to me that this is when we can, because profession and job labor has an important value uh, in uh, socialist culture, you know, that uh, labor is the main thing through which uh, people are divided and the citizens in the city are divided into uh, employees and uh, peasants and, uh, of course, workers, uh, industrial workers. This is the representative figure. Uh, and uh, that's how uh, work and uh, the, yeah, the job uh, becomes very important in uh, identifying the person and creating an identity and uh, also it, it, it gains a lot of uh, importance and it, it, it gives a lot of social capital because it is one of the things, actually it's the main thing through, through which uh, you, can, uh, you can go upwards, you can uh, obtain a kind of, I would say, upward uh, mobility. You, you, yeah. and, um, this is even even more true when we're talking about peasants because um, the people from Iska, uh, because actually uh, uh, Gerald Creed says when he studies uh, Bulgarian socialist village, he says that uh, they are the stepchildren of the socialist state uh, because the, the, the model figure is of course the industrial worker while the peasants uh, um, well, villages have all, they, they were always uh, uh, somehow connected with uh, tradition and uh, backward ways, even uh, after the collectivization uh, of uh, farms and uh, later on in the uh, creation of, oh no, okay, sorry, uh, in the creation of um, collective farming and uh, APECA. Uh, agrarian uh, production complexes. So uh, even after that, uh, in the, these forces to industrialize the, the village, uh, they were not very successful and villages were seen as a kind of uh, store that can pump up workforce in the uh, industrializing cities. And actually, uh, this was the only way for the people from villages to uh, to, to get a better life, considerably, well, yeah, a better life. Um, so uh, that's why a lot of the respondents actually, when they talk about uh, their life, they need to somehow give reasons and to justify why they left the village. Uh, so here you have, yeah, these are actually uh, real photos from the, uh, from the past of the village of Iskar. Uh, and you can see, yeah, they are blurred, just like the things I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so a lot of the respondents, um, uh, they uh, need to justify their reasons, to explain why they left the village. 
Um, uh, and um, uh, of course, the chance here plays an important part. And um, now uh, that's how uh, one guy talks about. Uh, so this uh, his uh, mobility and uh, his m m migration to the to the city uh, was by again by chance or by mistake. So he explains how uh, he was uh, proposed to uh, become an accountant uh, in uh, the uh, agrarian productive complex uh, in the village. Uh, but uh, there was a denunciation on behalf of some uh, members, party members in the village, and he was uh, uh, branded as a son-in-law of a kulak. I don't know whether you... Ah, yeah, so this is a kulak. Kulak, it, it comes from, uh, from Russian, and uh, yeah, this is a category, relatively affluent peasant, <coughs> branded by the Communist Party as a class enemy. So, uh, he was branded as a son-in-law of a Gulag and also a son-in-law of somebody who took part in uh, uh, repressions of communists uh, in the September uprising from 1923. And uh, the respondent uh, claimed that uh, this is actually, these accusations are not true and after a series of, of events and uh, some maneuvers and uh, negotiations, he actually found out that uh, uh, the person that they claimed was uh, 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 was uh, guilty uh, of uh, persecuting communists was called Georgi Atanasov, but his name, the respondent's uh, uh, name, was uh, Georgi Anastasov. So it was a mistake. Actually, finally, he cleared it out, but uh, and he sorted out the things. But this was his reason to uh, turn his back to. Uh, to the village and to move to another place. And he says that after he uh, left the village, um, he went to Vojido and he was in charge of a department and he goes on to say, the whole region respected me. I was a model employee. Then I went to Devnia, an industrial town nearby. They promoted me to a head of a brigade. They recognized me. They offered me to continue studying. So this is, uh, how to say, this is the, the, this by chance and by mistake uh, beginning of his uh, biographical and uh, career trajectory uh, somehow had a very happy, um, happy outcome. Uh, but the thing is, how is uh, the denunciations, uh, how are they, how they function in the, in the narratives? Okay, okay, right. So the thing is that uh, uh, denunciations and positive work appraisals, they are similar. They somehow, the biographical trajectory is reified. It's seen as something outside of the person that he cannot control. So uh, you, your profession and your career development is actually uh, a result of some external forces that direct, that direct you. You don't apply for a job. Uh, you are distributed, you know about this, uh, or you probably you don't know, about this uh, distribution of uh, young professionals throughout the country. Just like the, the state had to distribute goods throughout the country, rationally, evenly. Uh, by the same token, when uh, people, young people graduated from university, uh, they uh, were allocated places where they had to work. So, uh, you don't apply for a job, you get the job. And, um, Okay, so I'll have to skip certain things. <laughs> okay, uh, th but the thing is, and now this is important, how do people who somehow present their lives as, uh, uh, due to certain forces, to unforeseen circumstances, how do they again regain control of their life? How do they manage to present themselves as uh, agents, as people who can direct their lives and their choices? So uh, the thing is that they, uh, uh, when, when they talk about uh, sharing this good luck and this good, good fortune with the others, that's how they again become uh, independent. They feel themselves as independent. And uh, here I will uh, quote another one, a very dramatic uh, narrative of, of Velku, who says how by chance he purchased uh, Moskvich. This is a Moskvich. Um, 
in those times it was impossible to buy by chance a car. But he says, I'd never planned to buy it. And I went to a warehouse in Varna and the people who sold the cars knew me and I told them, so and so, I want the Muskvich. And uh, the people from the warehouse, they informed him that there were some cars uh, in the docks uh, in Varna and he managed to buy this car by chance. And he says, the Muskvich was the ambulance of Povelavovo, the place where he lived. As soon as uh, there was a woman in labor, so uh, a woman who was about to give birth, I would drive her to the hospital. I was the, uh, the ambulance. So they would tell me, Volkov, start the car. And uh, this is it. When you share the good luck and when you share the, uh, the, the good fortune with the others, that's how you are again, uh, you are able to present yourself as an, um, as an agent, as a person who has control of his life. And uh, so I'm about to finish now. And uh, uh, what I'll say uh, to sum up is that um, in these stories, uh, the chance loses its transcendental dimension. So it seems to be something out of control and uh, out of reach of, people's, of, uh, of people, but actually it's no longer inevitable, it's not unsurpassable. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, although uh, a lot of the uh, respondents, they use uh, either passive structures, I was supposed to, I was obliged to, I was given this and so on, or they use some kind of uh, impersonal uh, sentences. It was, and or they were, or it happened so. So although they use these structures that have no face, uh, gradually we see that uh, this chance and uh, this inexplicable thing uh, obtains a kind of face. So later on they refer to my friend from the human resources or comrade Stoichev from the county committee of the party or anti Natka from the Ministry of Defense. And uh, so in conclusion, I can say that the unexpected conclusion, so for me they were unexpected, uh, is that the Bulgarian post-socialist people have a very ambivalent attitude to their agency. Uh, because it, you, we expect from narrators to present their lives as uh, not as a result of some outside circumstances. The modern person is a self-made person, or at least this is the myth of the modern <coughs> person, self-made person, self-sufficient actor who masters his uh, destiny. But we can see that uh, these respondents, they very, uh, how to say, willingly uh, retreat from my uh, uh, agency and they are, they are happy to uh, lend their agency to some outside outside circumstances. And uh, actually, uh, the chance becomes a kind of solidary accomplishment. So it's not an individual act. Uh, the chance is the name of a kind of everyday solidarity and only after the narrator responds to the good turn, uh, only after they justify the good luck by working hard for the community's good, they can gain control of their life and they can present themselves in an acceptable way. So the chance and the luck obtains a meaning after being shared with the others. And actually this is what gives significance to the, wa the life well lived. And again, this background, um, uh, I can somehow find an explanation uh, to the nostalgic reminiscences because I think that most of the narratives uh, were very nostalgic. So the present is a kind of ruined project of the past and the present is very alienated and individualistic and I'll finish with a quote. So a woman from this village says, it saddens me a lot, honestly, I feel that day after day the village gets more and more deserted. Nobody wants to, everybody comes up in his shell. In his shell. Uh, you see people have changed, their characters have changed too. Somehow you can't find those people who had the good self-esteem, such a good self-esteem. Now their self-esteem is zero, a total zero. So they think how they are going to survive, what they should do, where they will get to, and uh, everybody with their problems. They show little care for the people around them. That's it.